Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the ITU AI and Machine and 5G Challenge webinar series. Thank you very much for sparing your valuable time to join this session today. My name is Thomas Pascal from the ITU, and it is my privilege to introduce today's webinar. The ITU AI and Machine and 5G Challenge webinar series is got organized by the ITU, which is United Nations Agency for ICTs. The mandate of the ITU is to allocate frequencies to services that uses the radio spectrum, to develop standards, and to assist developing countries in setting up their ICT infrastructure. This challenge is kindly sponsored by Xilinx and Ministry of Science and ICT Korea. We are grateful to uh, these organizations for their sponsorship. The challenge aims at creating a community that will solve network-related problems using AI and machine learning. Uh, machine learning. So at this point in time, I would like to introduce today's uh, speakers. Uh, this session is going to be presented by Marco Zenaro and Marcelo Rovai. Marco is a research scientist at the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics, ICTP in Trieste, Italy, where he coordinates the Science and Technology and Innovation Unit. And Marcelo is a volunteer professor at the Federal University of Itajuba uh, Engineering Institute in Brazil. Today's talk is about Tino ML, which is the intersection of AI, machine learning, and IoT. So I would maybe ask Marco is going to give the bits and introduction of what Tino ML it is. This is an interesting topic. It's a new technology that will enable machine learning right next to the physical world. So I would give uh, this time uh, to Marco to introduce. So welcome Marco and Marcelo. We are grateful to have you for the for the, this webinar and it's over to you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here and thank you for the invitation. So I'm Marco Zanaro from the uh, Abdul Salam ICTP and I will cover the part about IoT. So you see how IoT meets AI and then Marcelo will follow up with the part about TinyML. So let's start with the IoT part by looking at the definition. If you have read about IoT, you know that there is many definitions and people consider the IoT in different ways. But if we follow the recommendation of the ITU, ITU T 2060, the definition is the following. The IoT can be used as a global infrastructure for the information society, enabling advanced services by interconnecting things based on existing and evolving interoperable information and communication technologies. And the focus here is on the infrastructure. So with the ITU definition, IoT is about setting up a network of devices. In fact, if we look at the definition of a device, of an IoT device, the ITU defines it as a piece of equipment that has the mandatory capability of communication. And then there are some optional capabilities such as sensing, actuating, data capture, storage, and processing. And some devices also execute operations. So the point here, according to this recommendation, is that devices must be able to communicate to be part of the IoT. So in other terms, any device that can communicate can then be part of this huge network, this huge infrastructure. This IoT has some fundamental characteristics. And I would say that maybe the most important one is the enormous scale. So again, if you have read about IoT, you know that we're talking about billions and billions of devices. And in fact, according to the ITU recommendation, I say the number of devices that need to be managed and that communicate one with each other will be at least an order of magnitude larger than the devices connected to the current internet. And also the ratio of communication triggered by these devices is much higher. So enormous scale. And again, if you have read about IoT, I'm sure that you have read about this number coming from a Cisco report saying that in 2020, we will have 50 billion devices. So I think that, you know, 90% of the papers, articles that cover IoT, they always have this number. They say 2020, 50 billion devices. 
So 2020 is last year. So have we reached this number? Well, not really. And this is another figure from, from, from the ITU, which shows not only the scale, but also the, the rate at which this enormous scale has been reached. So you see there's mainframes, really small volumes in long time. Then you have PCs, much bigger volume in longer time. Then you have you know, mobile phones, but then you have internet of everything, the, the, the pink line, and you see that that is really, really fast. So getting back to the numbers and some statistics, this comes from Statista, and they claim that in 2020, there's about 8 billion devices. So still a huge number. There's about 4 billion people on the internet right now. So IoT devices are you know, twice that number. So that's large, but that's much lower than the 50 billion devices that Cisco was uh, you know, envisioning. Another company, IoT Analytics, they have you know, a higher number, 12 billion devices. Still, you know, that's almost a fifth of the number that Cisco uh, had, had predicted. So this is you know, huge numbers, but not as big as we, as we thought. What about the distribution? Well, as you can imagine, it's not really widely distributed. So this, come, this picture comes from a website called thinkful.net that shows the uh, IoT networks that publicly publish data on the internet. And you see there are some regions in the world which are very high density. So Europe is completely you know, covered by these blue dots showing you know, IoT devices that publish data openly on the internet. If you move to the Southern part of the world, as an example, the African continent, you see that there is dots, but not as many, and many regions are not covered. And the point here is that these regions are the ones which might need more devices. In fact, if we look at the SDGs, which we all know are you know, 70, 17 development goals, many of them can be uh, you know, accomplished by using IoT, or at least IoT can play an important role. Just two example, SDG2, zero hunger, we need to produce more food. By 2050, we need to uh, you know, produce almost 500 million tons of extra food. And we can use IoT to optimize food production. So IoT in agriculture can be used to optimize the production of food. We're talking about climate change. So SDG 13, climate action. We need to have more data about temperature and about climate in general. And again, we can use IoT to get these new measurements. So the point here is that IoT has been you know, growing at an incredible speed, but haven't reached that volume that we you know, predicted you know, 10 years ago, but still they can be used for many of these applications that have a clear impact on society. So what can be seen as drivers and obstacles for IoT? Well, drivers, definitely the low cost of devices. So just you know, in the last 10 years, the uh, cost of devices has dropped uh, significantly both for the processors as well as for the sensors. They wireless standards. So now you can buy devices from different vendors and they all work together. So that definitely is a driver. And of course, ITU has been working in, in this field. But then when we look at the obstacles, well, definitely the lack of internet connectivity. So these networks still need connectivity to send data from the devices to the cloud, so to the internet. The lack of IoT infrastructure, so to be able to set up these networks, you need to have an existing infrastructure or you should be able to set it up easily. And that gets to the last point, which is a complex ecosystem. So if you look at an IoT network, you need to have the devices, you need to have you know, the gateways, the cloud services. So it's quite a complex ecosystem. So I want to uh, finish this part. I say that maybe, given what you will learn from Marcelo in a second, this definition can be a bit simpler and can be in the following way. A device is a piece of equipment with capability of sending, actuating, data capture, storage, and processing. And some devices also 
execute operations. So with this evolution of technology and by allowing AI to be on really small devices, we don't really need to have these mandatory capabilities of communication. And that's all from my side. I will leave the floor to Marcelo to tell you more about TinyML. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, everyone. Well, <laughs> as Marco said, I mean, we are in a, in a very interesting time. When you talk about, about IoT, it's important for us to, to, to think that, uh, that uh, we have all those billions of devices collecting data all over the world. And this was fantastic and was very important the, the, because this happened in, in the, le the last years, this capture of data. And this data, this data goes to, uh, let's say, usually you, you go to, to you know, we, we up this, correct? And work with that and create big models with a lot of energy, a lot of infrastructure in a lot of complex in infrastructure. But what we can starting to see now with uh, TINML is a return to the, to, the, to the edge. Or what I'm talking about is, once you have this model trained or created in the cloud, we can spread this model to do the inference, to use the model together with the devices to get rid of the things inside the physical world. So this is TNML. So going a little bit more in this kind of a, a definition. So what's a really TNML? So TNML, first of all, is the fastest growing field that we see in machine learning. Machine learning? We are talking about uh, AI, yes. Machine learning is a subfield of AI. So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning is the piece of uh, uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence that's trying to go into that huge amount of data, extract, extract from that data some, some meaning, some feature, something that uh, is unique for this type of data, okay? And inside machine learning, it's another, another word that we listen a lot, is deep learning. That's a special part of machine learning that uses neural networks that try to emulate our, our neurons here in, in our, in our, in our brain. And deep learning is very suitable working with the big data. That's exactly the amount of data that's generated by those devices. Okay, so having machine learning that's using data, we need to, you need to have you know, hardware, software, a lot of algorithms that all this together, okay, is capable to do analytics inside the device. That's very important. But when we're talking about doing this inside the device, we are talking about lower power consuming, consumption. So it's, it's devices, are devices that, you know, instead of uh, tons of, uh, of uh, watts that you, that you use in, 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 in big data centers in the cloud, we're talking about microwatts, milliwatts, small device that can run inside a forest, you know, inside a very empty areas with really, you know, with only a very, uh, only with a, let's say, small batteries. And more, more important than that, they are always, because they use lower power, are devices that can, is running all the time. So that, that's very important. So what's TNML? is a part of machine learning, is a part of artificial intelligence, but it's running inside the physical world in very, very, very small devices with a very low power, lower memory, and it can be working all the time, every day. That, that's very important. And that we can see to nowadays, we can see applications in every area. The most common, of course, is in our home. Everybody, has a personal assistant, Alexa, Google Assistant, etc. Siri. We are used to do that. Everywhere in the world, you can see those kind of device. This is a kind of TNML. I will explain a little bit better. We have TNML inside of that. Not all of that, but uh, um, the most important part is TNML. Okay. We can also see this in office nowadays using using camera to open and to, to start light or, or, or turn off lights, for example, or in industry. 
And when you're talking about industry, you're talking about much more than machinery. We're talking about huge, huge new, new words where TNML can be found. Nowadays, we saw TNML, for example, using for uh, uh, preventive maintenance. I can have remote machine machinery that you can have small small devices running models that can that can feel if a machine if a machine is not working properly. And so so only when when I realize that the machine is not working properly, I can you know turn on some kind of a communication device. And only in that part I can use more power to send that kind of information, or even to let's say. To, to turn on some device to, to help manage that situation on local without any type of communication. So we're talking about the, doing something specific without the communication. That's very important. We saw this, for example, in logistics nowadays. You can track you know, containers all over the world with the devices inside the goods and see what's going, going on. And also most important in, in the human and animal sensing area with the medical area, TNML is, is, uh, is, is a fine, a fantastic way. For example, I can show you to, to the left, you can see, for example, an experiment that you are doing in, uh, in, uh, in our university in Brazil, for example. Those are students that uh, they have developed a ECG monitor for atrial fibrillation that you know you can use a few dollars, less than fifty dollars, forty dollars, something with a very very low cost. We can train 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 a model in the, in the cloud with a lot of data. But when you have the model trained, we have techniques to shrink the model, put the model in very very small devices, like very very small small devices, like small microcontrollers, and you can and, and verify if a if a person. Uh, uh, has a problem in, her, in, in their heart and can go send these people to, to the doctor with a very you know a very low 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 cost. The same you are seeing this kind of um, of city, situation happening in Africa nowadays. For example, try to save animals. There is a project. It's Elephant Edge. All, all those uh, you can see. We we I think that you guys can have access to the, the presentation. You can see the the, the links. Uh, you can you can go there and see what's going on in in those projects. Nowadays, for example, we are trying to save elephants in Africa, analyze their behavior with movements or uh, capturing their sound, uh, understand how they communicate, helping with the image to see if, uh, if, if, uh, if uh, a hunter is, is in the same area, something like that. And all of that at the elephant, inside the elephant, let's say in a special kind of collar. So this is important. So we are not using communication, okay? So again, all of this is only possible because we're talking about IoT. This is only possible because we're talking about uh, a lot of uh, things or endpoint devices that are here, you know, in, in our in our in environmental that uh, that uh, capture those kind of information and go to the clouds. Okay, and when this happens, what we're doing is all this information in the cloud means data. And when we put together data and artificial intelligence, or using this data to run big models, that's what we can really extract from that is value, okay? And this is what we're kind of AIoT or the, the, the mix of uh, artificial intelligence with IoT, when you can have this data, but not only the data itself, but when you use the data to run machine learning models, to extract information from that. Perfect, but okay. But we are talking, we are here to talk about TNML. TNML is exactly that what we have discussed before, but doing the, the inference at the edge or, or better, the edge of the edge, okay? Because we will talk, not talking about the edge of a, a network, but more than that, we are talking about the doing the inference at the same device that generate the data. So this is this is this is very important. So for example, suppose okay, we know now that it, when we're talking about TML, we are talking about the intelligence or models that usually was trained here in the cloud. Now is spread all over the network. So let's suppose that you have one specific device here, a microphone, and I want to 
to work with that, uh, that device. So exactly like, as, as, as I said before, we are talking about, uh, for example, uh, Alexa. How Alexa works? Uh, if, I think of, if I said before, I mean, confirming now that Alexa is part of the TNML, let's say, uh, universe, how this work? Well, this device is always on. He's working, but he's not connected to anywhere. You know, it's not, not sending information to, to the clouds. In fact, it's running here inside, but listen, the environmental. And when someone, for example, say, hey, Alexa, what's going on is, there is a small model here inside the device that will wake up. And in this case, he will connect a huge, let's say a, a, a bigger models in the cloud, in this case, in, 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 in Amazon. And this model, in this case, it starts to interact with the person. Oh, what's your name or what's the temperature? And some, in this case, we need information that are in the cloud. But the beginning of this process happened here, only here, was completely offline. And that's important. So TNML, it enables machine intelligence right next to the physical world. Okay, and much and more than that. Okay, I can uh, avoid the issues as Marco explained before, like latency, power consumption, and also security. So this is very important for us when we're talking about you know areas when you don't have infrastructure. So I can I can use models that we run inside the devices with very low power and not need to communicate. So in this specific case, is to to wake up another device, I can use, I, I don't need a big infrastructure, correct? Perfect. And a little bit about, about technology. What we have here, in fact, inside those kind of devices are micro, microcontrollers. As, as Marco said before, what I experienced today is a lot of a powerful microcontrollers powerful devices with a very low price. So in this case, for example, the family that you can see in, inside an Alexa is exactly the same that you can, that, that you can see inside the, the most advanced or mid-level of Arduinos, for example, a development board largely used by, by developers around the world. So in this case, it's, a, a, it's CPUs with a ARM Cortex M4. Doesn't matter what is this, but it's only, you know, powerful 32 bits, et cetera. But the, the, the interesting thing is the microcontroller that are here in such kind of device, this, this, the, this Echo Dot or Alexa or whatever, you know, uh, is the same device that you can find here in those kind of uh, microcontrollers, okay? And this is important because we're talking about, when I'm talking about this kind of device, I have more than one tier here. So we are talking about TNML is the first part that's running by this very small processor here that they can only one task, listen the ambient and trigger a bigger solution, a bigger uh, uh, function, like, you know, uh, uh, start, start uh, connect, uh, turn on a radio to connect uh, with, uh, with, um, with uh, Amazon and it starts to send information, blah, blah, blah. But TNML is what inside, it's the first thing that happened. So what enables TNML <clears throat> are the microcontrollers. And in this case, we're talking about small microcontrollers that you can find everywhere. You can find in my watch, for example, and you can also do uh, uh, ECG, for example, see my heart from my watch. I can monitor what's going on. If I, if I, include, like, if I fail, I can uh, set, send an alarm because I have a model here that it was trained to understand what's my normal behavior. And I change this kind of a behavior, he can send an alarm, for example, okay? Uh, so size is important. We're talking about TML is, is in very small devices with low power, what fantastic. I can use batteries that during years. So if you think about solutions or, or, or functions or, projects that should be running inside remote areas, we must have a way that that kind of device, we don't need to change batteries uh, uh, frequently, should work for years, 
in that time okay or with a small uh, solar panels that you 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 help to to continue to work that, that, that's the that, that's the case okay and low, key, low low cost is exactly because you have this this let's say big big number of devices uh it's producing more and more and more of course and the cost uh, went down fantastic so in short tnml is something that runs in very small devices with a very small memory, consumes a lot of a very, very low power, okay? And it's always on, that's the idea. So our devices that can be running all the time and that's, and without any communication and consuming a very low power. But again, every time you're talking about TNML, we are talking about inference. What means inference? I took a model that was was trained with uh, you know a lot of power in big in big cloud data centers. But I took that model, I shrink that model with the with the techniques, uh, the modern techniques, and I can put those kind of models to run any small microcontrollers. So this is TNML. Okay, so let's see some examples of the application. As we saw before, uh, we have a. It, it, we, we talk about, about uh, uh, Alexa. I'm talking a lot about Alexa because it's very easy. It's something that everybody has in, in their home, okay? But it's not only that. We also have TNML, for example, in areas when I use uh, uh, time series sensors, like, like uh, uh, accelerometers, for example, or gyroscopes that you can track movements or it can have in this in this area that uh, time series uh, uh, data we can we can we can work with the temperature pressure and so infor information that came from uh, from environmental i can do control of the environmental without need to to go to the to the big cloud uh, systems okay and also vision that's the, one of the most important areas of TNML, in fact, one of the most important areas of machine learning is not learning nowadays, because uh, was vision that starts the boom about uh, about machine learning or, or deep learning back ten years ago when people start to develop models that could understand image, can recognize people, can differentiate, you know one animal for a person, et cetera, okay? So let's try to go to these three pillars a little bit to give you some, uh, some ideas. So, so let's start with sound. Okay, when I'm talking about sound, of course, the first thing that came, came to our mind, of course, is the personal assistant, fantastic. Personal assistant, we can see everywhere in our, in our, in our home nowadays, okay? You can use personal assistant you know, not only to make questions, but turn on the lights, turn off the light, turn on TV, turn off the TV, or you help you to control uh, your environment inside your home. You can also see, see nowadays inside cars, for example, that you can use your voice to, to give comments, to wake up your car, something like. But those are, let's say, fancy, uh, common uh, examples but it's much more than that. In fact, it's much more than voice. Nowadays, for example, we can see TNML uh, uh, being applied to security, okay? For example, I can use, I can train a small model to you know, listen for, the, for a, a broken glass. The sound of a broken glass is very well defined. So I can use that sound to train a model to identify if you have a, a security breach in your in your home or or school or whatever when when a uh, 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 window was broken, you can use that for 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 example for anomaly detection. I can use for example if I have a machine and the sound the machine is not working properly, I can set up an alarm or in a electrical environmental I can I can listen for example the sound of a transformer. And if this, this change in a strange situation, you know, I have a small model that can, you know, turn on uh, uh, very quickly without latent alarm or disconnect the system or do some, some uh, operation at the local. So it's more and more using like, like that. In medical way, 
sound is very is using a lot nowadays. We are we during the, the last couple of years with the COVID uh, problem pandemic pandemic, we saw for example a lot of experiments with uh, toss. So people people using the sound of the toss the cough the cough. <coughs> No, to see if the, the, the cough is, is dry or wet. So this is could be a flu or could be a COVID. And you can imagine if, you're, if, I, if I can train such kind of model, I'm talking about a test that can do in a very low cost and you can spread this, this device for remote areas we, we, where we don't have money to go to the very fancy PCR tests or you know, or such kind of thing, or image, big image tests. So this is very, very important. Also, for example, when you are you are sleeping, there is a lot of uh, a lot of problems with sleeping that you can only by the sounds when you snore or 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 how you are breathing, uh, you, you you can control that or analyze if you have a problem or not, and also set up alarms or or or. Contr or some controls completely offline only with the sound in nature we are seeing more and more use of sound to control and help to control uh, for example bees nowadays there are projects that you can by the sound analyze if for example the queen is inside you know where where the bees are or not so if you have a problem there you know you have you have the sound of a normal Normal group of bees are, are, are the behavior of, of, of there, but if, if something happened or the bee is not the, the, the queen is not there or something like, you can also set an alarm. So this is very important because we the, all over the world we are trying to save the bees, and TNML is, is using to that. Also, for example, we are we are doing a project in ICTP with the, with the Dr. Marco Zanaro and his, his students. Where we are looking for, you know, uh, uh, insects like mosquitoes, uh, the dengue mosquitoes, for example, uh, by the sound of the mosquitoes to classify classify them or to to understand where they are, something like that. To that. So it's important. Okay. So sound. When I say TNML, sound is a very very important area, but not only this kind of a simple device in industry, medical, nature. So take this in, in, in mind, how many things you can do. Okay, going to vibration is another, another area. Here, okay, the first thing that came to our mind, wow, fantastic, for, for vibration, I can, I can see in industry, as I said, I see if a machine is working properly or not. No, but not only that, I can train, for example, uh, accelerometers here, in my, you can imagine, these are experience in Africa, when you have cows, okay, and you can, by the movement of the cow, I can, you know, took the, the, the motion of the cow and see, oh, this cow is, is, uh, is, is, is walking, this, this cow is, is being feeding or resting, something like. So you can analyze and understand the cow behavior and you can pre preview if the cow is with a problem or not. It's not, it's not feeding properly or not the resting properly, something like that, okay? I said it before. I only I only pay attention again about the elephant project because you have you can enter here and then all the technical details if you want in this link. You can pray for for vibration. Not all, including I didn't mention, but uh, sound you can use also sound to understand how the the elephants communicate between them. But uh, you can use here to movements when this elephant has a color, for example, to understand their behavior, if they are aggressive or standing or sleeping, and also, you know, you, you capture data, training that, and after that, you can take some, some measures based on their, their behavior, okay? In transportation, as I said, if you, if you move containers around the world, if you, have, if you have here, if you have small microcontrollers with the accelerometers, I can, I can capture the data and know what's going on with the goods. And I don't, you don't need to send information by satellite or whatever. I can only analyze that. And instead to have tons of data, continuous data about the movement being sent, I have only, I can, I can store a small couple of bytes about, oh, this is, I'm a, use a forking lift or a, is a ray or terrestrial or something like that. You know, only a few bytes, you can, you can have that information. 
and in fact, we, 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 we all had talk about that. And about vision, I said vision is a fantastic and very important area for TNML. So it's not only, you know, with the fancy, fancy areas department or offices when you can, you know, define if a people are not people to call elevator or something like, you know. I can, for example, use, use image to detecting diseases in plants. This, for example, was a project in Uganda when uh, by phone, we capture all the, the, the information or the image and you can, you know, train a model in the cloud, but that model after, after the, uh, we train, you can shrink, put back in the telephone, it's not thin ML itself because the telephone uh, is edge ML because telephone, uh, smartphone use more, more power, but we don't need communication. I can give the telephone for a not a specialized person. That's, that person can use the telephone, the camera of, the, of a simple telephone, the smartphone, and, and see the see the the, the leaf is oh this is a being rust, for example. And uh, even a, a normal farmer, a simple farmer in very poor in, in, in simple areas, can understand if their plant has a problem or not. There are several projects like that. You have projects with coffee beans in Brazil, other projects in other areas in Africa with another type of plants. So, I mean, this is one area, farm is one area that you are seeing a lot of TNML, a lot of TNML. Equipments that have a system that capture imagine the images and can define you know, what's going on there in the, in, in, in the field. So this is very important. Also, for example, nowadays is is a big problem that humanity are suffering is is, is the the far, forest fires, big fires. We saw in Amazon, in Brazil, in not only Amazon, not, not only Brazil, but all the Amazonia in Brazil, in Colombia, Peru, Venezuela. We saw all that area. It's a lot of problem with fire in, in the last couple of years, for example, and uh, in also areas in Africa and so on. In, in, in Australia. And uh, with the TNML, I can de develop systems that you can, you know, looking for the, only looking for the image. So you have capture frames or from a, a video, analyze the frames of a video. We can analyze if there's a fire or not a fire. Okay. This is a project that we did in, in Brazil, but this is another project, for example, that was the same concept was uh, included in a, in a very small airplane. We can have uh, drones that they use nowadays, but you can go to an area and analyze if there is a, a fire or not. So this is image is, is a fantastic area. We saw, for example, uh, image, the most common sink that we, or application, or the first application that we saw for TNML was, for example, to open uh, door, doorbells no that you can only see an image to see if you're a person or not a person okay but you can use that not only to see if I can, if you have a person or not a person i can use that for example to see if a, a person has a mask or not a mask for example in situations i i, I need to check automatically i can i can i can use i can use such kind of uh, of um, of a device okay well so there is a lot of uh, applications, okay? All of this TNML is part in artificial intelligence. And always when you talk about the artificial intelligence came the discussion about general artificial intelligence or the world will be, you know, take over by, by, by robots or whatever. First of all, it's important that we, we have always in mind, in a clear mind that uh, general in artificial intelligence does not exist yet probably in the next 20, 30 years, or I don't know if this century, we saw a kind of a general artificial intelligence that can also be working in a small device. But the important is what we have today with machine learning and also with TNML are dedicated applications. So we saw a lot of uh, image classification applications. We can have all the detection also in TNML. We have, we're talking about sound recognitions that you can use that gesture motion recognition we, we, we show that example anomaly detection so all this in in, in the tinamel uh, environmental and to finish i think it's important for us to have have in mind that 
every one of those applications, every time that we work with AI, we work, be responsible. AI should and must be something for good. There is not something like good or bad uh, or evil artificial intelligence. What we have is how the how they use that we do we do with that, and more than that, how we capture the data. Even in TNML, very simple devices like we discussed now, it's all important for us to have in mind that the bias is something that that we must to avoid. If you develop a simple device like this one, you must be sure that I capture voices from men, from women, from children, people from America, from Africa, from Asia, so we can have, you know, the majority of the people, we have no bias. The same with the image, when you use the image for anything, you know, we must, we must use from everywhere. So take in consideration that the data must be with no bias, okay? And the model must, must be always think about with responsibility. So let's do it, okay? And uh, that's it, thanks, and uh, stay safe. safe. <laughs> thanks a lot, Marcelo, for this quite interesting uh, intro, I would say, to Tina ML. So, and also yes. thanks to Marco uh, for the brief overview of this field. So uh, this is quite an interesting field. I would like to go directly into the Q and A. Uh, Vishnu will take over and moderate the Q and A. So over to you, Vishnu. Thanks, Thomas, and uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, uh, Marco and Marcelo. Thank you so much for that excellent talk. Can I ask you this question on behalf of them? That how do I start as a student? Okay, Mar Marcelo, can I, can I answer that? Yes. Okay, so uh, there are quite a number of available resources on the internet. In fact, we created a, a, a group, which is a, a, about a making tiny ML available for the academic community. And in this initiative, one of the activities is about gathering the information about the courses. And I will post the link on the chat and you will see that there is a number of open courses. I would say that the most complete and long one is the one organized by ADX, by Harvard University. And it's in four parts and you can take the course for free. And if you want to get a certificate, you have to pay for the certificate. But all the content is available so you can take the whole course for free. Then there is the course that Marcelo has organized in Brazil and the slides and the videos are available for that course as well. There's one course organized by Coursera. And then there's a course that ICTP has organized about a month ago. And in that case as well, the videos and the slides are available. So I will post that information on the chat for the students in the group. Well, only to complement Marco, I think that one of the challenge of our group and TNML4G is to spread uh, spread this knowledge uh, for the developing countries. So, for example, as Marco said, those ADS and Coursera course are the slides and, and the, the, the course are in, in English. In Brazil, we try to keep the, 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 the English slides, let's say, to compatibility, but the courses are, are we are doing in Portuguese. This is good because, for example, not we have nowadays not people from only from Brazil, but also people, uh, for example, from Mozambique. Uh, we have uh, people that have been working with the Professor Marcos Zanaro in, in in Trieste. They are now doing our course uh, in Brazil. So the idea is also to spread to the the Portuguese countries uh, in not not only in America but also in Africa and Asia. We have uh, some initiatives from the uh, starting next year with the courses full in Spanish, with material in Spanish and course in Spanish, led by uh, uh, Professor Jesus in uh, in Colum Colombia University. So, so that's the idea. We have uh, courses and uh, in several languages at least. You know. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That answers that question. Uh, I want to ask uh, something from the chat window. Mohammed is asking, uh, where is the model screened? Yes, this is a question which uh, I was discussing with Marco earlier as well. This, uh, where do you get the data, first of all? I want to expand Mohammed's question a little bit. Where do you get the data? Uh, how do you collect the data? Uh, for example, the queen bees example that Marcelo explained or the elephant example that he explained, right? So how do you get the data and where do you train the models? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I can, my take on that. Uh, there are data sets available. So for example, uh, the project that Marcelo, uh, you know, described about the mosquito monitoring using these small and you know cheap devices to monitor what kind of mosquito you're listening to that data set is available openly on the internet so some data sets are available on the other hand i think for projects that are more interesting for you know specific communities i would say that data has to be gathered and there is one example of a student uh, i have in in west africa and he's working with a uh, cotton plant diseases and in that case, that kind of data set is not available. It's very specific and very specific to that region. So that data set has to be, you know, gathered and labeled. Yeah. Oh, the fantastic. Yeah. And, and, and I should uh, reinforce that this question is important because, you know, data is really the most important part of the machine learning uh, environment, let's say, or, or, or workflow. And everybody, a lot of people put a lot of attention in the model itself, how we create the model. But, you know, like if, if as people now in data, now in my environmental data science used to say, if you enter with garbage as a data, you'll get garbage at the out. So the data is important. So, so with the TNML, we should, we should have specific data sets. And people are working on that. When we work, when we work for 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 nature uh, or new areas, like Professor Marco said, for example, in this case, with the cotton or with the bees, the bees example, the most part of the data should be collected locally. You also, when you have data that is available avail available at the internet, someone gets that and put that because and I and I encourage every one of you guys that are doing projects have your data available for others to use that. But also we can complement with my data because we need to have different data from different areas. In that specific project that uh, you guys can find in the internet, people that, that develop the work with the model for the bees, they got the sound inside inside the, where the bees are. So they collect it because it, it's a part of machine learning that we know supervised machine learning. So, oh, this is a normal, the, the normal behavior of the bees, let's capture the data. And we need a lot of data. So we capture the sound and say, okay, and put a label, oh, this is sound for the bees. So we have different type of bees, bees in different areas. So we put all that together and we make the model in the cloud. We'll do them or big machines. And after that, when was the second part of your question, when you have the model done, we shrink that and you put again in very small devices and you can put that device inside where the bees or the, or where the, 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 the insects are. Thank you so much. That explains both the questions. That actually, that brings to my next question, which is uh, Marco. It's different Marco. <laughs> different Marco is asking. He's asking uh, um, about privacy. So if you collect the data, uh, of course, sound related, vibration related, uh, perhaps the elephants don't care about privacy. Perhaps the bees don't care about privacy as well. But if you collect the data from humans, then of course the question of privacy comes. How do you handle that? And then you also mentioned about uh, training in cloud, optimizing, and then bringing it back to the tiny devices. There are we making certain compromises in terms of weights and parameters of the models which will impact its uh, performance and accuracy. Those are the two questions that I want to take from Marco. 
Okay, so let, let me reply to the first one and then Marcelo can reply to the second one. So about privacy, yes, definitely. But like in each and every AI related uh, application, right? So from uh, you know Marcelo's slides about doing responsible AI, I think that you know privacy issues must be considered when designing your application. So they have to be taken on into account at the beginning. And I would say that perhaps in TinyML, that's even more important because now you're having hundreds or you know thousands of devices scattered in the environment. And if you have to reprogram these devices, it's going to be really cumbersome and difficult. So that uh, you know, responsible AI by design really has to be taken into account even with a higher priority, I would say, than the normal AI projects. And, uh, and, uh, and another important thing is when you are capturing, we, we also, again, we need to separate things. Let, let's forget about TNML. Let's talk about general machine learning application, face recognition. Uh, when I, I'm creating the model of a face recognition, okay, I need to capture a lot of faces. And this is usually people that uh, uh, gave authorization. When I, I'm, a, I'm a researcher, developer, I, I should use data sets that are, uh, let's say, official, that the people authorize it, or I, I collect the data from people that authorize it, blah, blah, blah. So at the end of the day, the model was created with all authorized, let's say, human figures. Perfect. But when you took that model and, and put that model to do inference, let's say we went in an airport or whatever, and people took my face there, something like, or whatever I, I'm going, I, I didn't give the authorization to use that to do the inference because inference is the use of the model for new data. I didn't give that. And usually, People took that, 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 that face and sent to somewhere my real face and put in a database to make the comparison with their data. So there is no privacy. So, so let's say I need to have a, to give a, a official something. But with TNML is different. Part in that, I use authorized image to do the, to do the let's say people are not people, when I put that to the small device, okay, I put it in a small device here. Let's say this is a small device with camera. This is a, this is a Arduino and this is a camera. When I use this model that was creating somewhere with the authorized the image, and I put here, okay, all right, and took my image, my image is not going to anywhere. I'm 100 secure. My private is guaranteed. Only the information that, 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 that goes out of the model is, is a person, not a person. This person use mask, do not use, does not use mask. It's not Marcelo, there's no idea about Marcelo and my face is not going to ever anywhere. So this is really, really important. Uh, so, so TML is helping the, the security because of that. And I think the second part of the question was uh, how we do that. The good news is, we have big companies that, for example, one of them, Google, for example, that, that took uh, uh, create create like uh, frameworks like TensorFlow, is frameworks that were developed for aiming big machine learning uh, uh, solutions. But what they are doing in the last years was shrink to, to TensorFlow Lite and also shrink much more to TensorFlow Lite Micro that one of the, the leads is Pete Ward, that, that uh, they are doing this and all those research is put available on the, on, on the web for use for everyone. This is, this is very nice. And companies, other companies like uh, Edge Impulse is a brand new company with a very young and bright guys, guys that came from big companies like Google or Warm and decide to create uh, companies that can work all over the world with a lot of a, a great part of their, their what they, they put available is completely free and open. You can use their cloud environmental, send your data, make everything there, get your model and use your model. And they are, don't matter if you use for commercial or not commercial, et cetera. And, uh, and, and, and if you're for research or something, they, they, give, us, they give you a lot of uh, support. We are using this in, 
in our university in Brazil. And uh, I saw other universities that I work with them and they are very open to help. So, so I think Google is one example that all the Google infrastructure and the uh, edge impulse, there are others, but I like keep those. So, so, so Marcelo, do, do you see performance uh, impacts by uh, when, when such optimizations are done by such frameworks? Yes. For example, when I say that the uh, edge impulse put this together, they help us to, to go to over all the steps to develop a machine learning. They help us to took the data, to pre-process the data, to take the, to, to, to do the, the feature extraction, to model our model, okay? And after we do the training and after the training, analyze all the accuracy, all the FU1s and, uh, and all the, 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 let's say the points that, 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 that you can test if that, uh, my model is correct or not. And, only, and when I'm okay with that, they help us to do the deploy that took that model that was already tested and uh, shrink it and 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 uh, put this in in to be run in a in a microcontroller and give understood. to you an example. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Actually, that brings to the next question that is uh, on federated learning. I want to slightly enhance. Marco's question with uh, maybe uh, techniques, privacy preserving techniques as well, because you mentioned sending of data, training uh, based on data. That's why I'm asking, does the federated learning mechanism have any role to play in TinyML? And if so, uh, should we look at privacy preserving mechanisms also in this context? I mean, I think it's a difficult question. I mean, because it's it's part of the project itself. When you do a project, you must you as a research, you must guarantee that your data you have authorization to use your data. No, I mean you are the owner of your data, and you must not only authorization of your using the data, but also to 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 have the data that you really, really uh, uh, came from all, let's say, different possibilities. As, as I explained, I will do a, something related to the voice, uh, some, some project or a cough or whatever. And this voice should be, you know, all type of gender or type of uh, 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 regional uh, uh, accent or whatever. So, so we must guarantee that. And when you, you, you go and uh, go to that, those uh, system to, to be training, of course, when you sign with them, you have an agreement that they are not using that data because of course they will have access to that, to that data. So you must guarantee that your data, it's, 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 it's okay, go there. They will not use that data, okay? And uh, you training and uh, you return the model. I don't know if it is exactly the question, but I mean, it, it's a kind of process, no? Vishnu, I, I posted in the chat a paper about a federated learning for tiny ML. My, my take is that these devices, as, as Marcelo said, tend to be extremely low power devices. And in federated learning, you need to have the communication of some sort. So I think the research challenge is now, how can you, uh, you know, have this communication in such a way that the device is still a low power device? All right, so the, uh, yeah, I would, I would say that that is a technical challenge. Mm -hmm. Understood. There is some question on trust. Uh, I believe uh, I believe Marcelo's previous answer probably answers that question. Probably this is a bigger uh, point about data and trust, uh, which we can uh, discuss maybe later and maybe not directly related. Uh, that's my guess from what Marcelo was explaining just now. Let me look at uh, let me look at something more really interesting questions. Uh, what is your opinion about IoT and its application with devices that aims to be intra-body? So yeah, so we, we saw this uh, fibrillation example. Uh, you, you showed that picture as well, a photo of the student and the fibrillation example uh, and with the ECG, I should say. Uh, what about uh, more intrusive techniques? I think the question Amina is asking is about more intrusive techniques within the body. 
uh, you know, <laughs> there are several implants which are coming as well. So I guess the question is coming from there. No, yeah, I mean, this is a, one of the huge areas that TNML will, will, will explode, let's say. Uh, we, we, we saw this kind of, remember, it's not really TNML, but uh, what kind of it, when you have a, 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 I don't know, in Portuguese is marca passo, that device that you put inside your body to control your heart, no? It's like that, you have a sensor that see your heart, it's a kind of a mechanical and electrical thing that you try to keep your, your, your heart in a, in a pace. No, in a pacer or something like, no? Uh, uh, nowadays, I can do that electronically. I can have a, a, those kind of uh, sensors. Now we don't need the electrical or big stuff. It would be a very small you know, millimeters uh, 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 microcontroller with the memory that you have a model inside. And this you can, you know, realize if there is a, a kind of problem, maybe he can, uh, uh, open a send a send a, a medicine, for example. In fact, we have examples that they are using for uh, a glucose, for example, on people that have problem with sugar. So you have implants nowadays. You can implant the, the sensors, and the sensors there is model that depend of the, the 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 level and the condition of the body. Not only the level, but that that's the point. It's not the one. So you can you can you can analyze, for example, the temperature, the everything you. And the, and the, the, that's the, 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 the fantastic thing. Your, your model has several inputs and you can decide, no, I have put this kind of a medicine and this is the amount to do with this, this situation. Much more, much more complex or much more, much more effectively than you know, when you remember to do the, just blood, the, 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 the sugar test in your blood, et cetera. And, uh, and if you go deeper on that, you have you know, the, the new Elon Musk uh, company that have put uh, devices in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the, the brain. And that are devices that inside the brain, they have the models inside, and there are models that there is no communication with the outside, there is, should be work with a very low power. That's TNML, that's TNML. And again, so, so, should so be working up going away. <laughs> Marcelo, I, I, I have, uh, let's say, let's say in future, I have an implant. You know, I am a Superman. I'm really happy with the, the implant. And now I want to update the model, right? That, that's what Abhishek is asking. So I want to update the model, which is in, unfortunately inside my brain. So now what do I do now? How, how should I update the model? Well, well, can can yeah, I, can I, yeah that, that, that I saw in, in the Q&A, it's an extremely interesting question because now you have a model that you find out that it is biased or there is some error or something. So you need to update it. And that's challenging again, because it again has to do with communication. So just to be listening, if there is a new model to be sent requires a huge amount of energy. So every time you have you know, communication, you consume a lot of energy. So either if you transmit or even if you're only uh, uh, you know, waiting for a message to come. So it is feasible, of course. And in fact, there is research about that and how to optimize that and how to send only small messages that only update small parts of the model, but it still requires quite a lot of energy. So I, I think... It, it boils down to, to what we said about this responsible AI, so that you have to design things properly in the first place. So this, again, has to do with, you know, designing your model also properly beforehand. Marcelo, please. But, uh, yeah, no, no, this is a, this is a challenge because you, you have any, every model has a leakage because the, the, the situation change, you know? A model, a model uh, uh, not in ML, but a, a machine learning model that was developed before the, the COVID era, Change completely. People nowadays use masks. They didn't use masks before, etc. So it's a kind of a leakage. They say model leakage, etc. So model, data change, model change. So, so when you develop something, is only is only a machine learning model, and that applies apply to TNML model also or, or environmental. When you develop such kind of thing, it's not only capture data in a good way pre-process the data, develop the model, test it, and do the deploy. It's, it's a cycle. When you deploy the model, you continue to measure or see the data. Nowadays, where people are working inside the TNML models is 
continuously, I am I'm using in some cases the, the new data that's been captured to retuning the model, the IP parameters of the model inside the, 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 the TNML. Of course, it's much more complex, is in a is in a study stage, but this is the future because as Marco said, it's a challenge and it's a problem in any machine learning uh, project. Not only I team. think I see an opportunity. I, uh, you know, some of us, <laughs> some of us claim to be experts in this area. I think the system design, right? System design is a very interesting field, especially if you have uh, really strict constraints like you are describing. This is a really interesting field. We should talk offline. But uh, meanwhile, there is a new customer here. Uh, I think this is a this is a new area for you. That is, uh, Bob is asking, do you work with artists? So now this is a very interesting field. I think, um, you know, Marcelo and Marco, you talked about different verticals. Uh, we saw health, we saw animals, but uh, we haven't seen artists. So uh, are there models? Uh, how artists uh, can apply tiny ML and uh, examples and so on? So would you like to comment, please? Well, uh, interesting that because they are in, in, machine, in machine learning area, we are seeing a lot of uh, applications with art nowadays, you know, creating art or uh, mixing uh, 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 doing, let's say, what the, the Van Gogh style mixed with, uh, you know, your style when you paint something. So it, it's a fantastic area. To be very honest, I didn't see yet such kind of thing apply to, to the TNML itself. Because again, TNML is a lot of focus in capture uh, uh, physical uh, data from sensors and uh, and work on that to actuate in the in the in the in the in the in the environmental again including one thing interesting is tnml when we do tnml we are not really in, a lot of interested in uh, uh, uh let's say show this in a, in, a, in a way including to humans sometimes i, I get information from 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 uh from the nature work it and return that in a, in, in a way is different with all the other areas so unfortunately i don't know I, I don't know example with uh, in, the, in the art area, but uh, it's an interesting question. I don't know, Mark, if you know. No, I don't. I don't. But then again, I mean, similar to the kind of Arduino development and these super low cost devices, being them so low cost, I think artists will pick up this new technology and will come up with something which we haven't yeah, thought about. Music. Right? <laughs> well, now look, music is something that is interesting that you can maybe use TNML, you know, to capture. To capture sound and work with the sound and took some um, I don't know maybe you can you can see something like that. So I, I know that there is image creation techniques which are happening and uh, as well art creation is happening text generation is happening so we are getting there. Bob perhaps there is an opportunity there uh, to write up a use case and we can discuss later. Uh, unfortunately, there is Thomas, and that is a clue <laughs> for me to stop. Uh, <laughs> so we should probably take the uh, uh, the remaining questions in the, the you know uh, part two later, maybe you know. Uh, but it is quite interesting. Thank you so much for uh, remaining, uh, staying back, and answering all the questions very patiently. Um, uh, actually, mo I see that most of the participants are here too. So, so perhaps, uh, perhaps I should ask one last question, Thomas, um, about optimization. About optimization. Actually, most of the remaining questions are about optimizations. So, uh, I want to revisit this again. You know, pruning quantization techniques which are applied, which we are familiar with we in, in the AI ML field, you know, uh, what we work in, in ITU, we have done considerable amount of work we claim to in this field. And we have looked at challenges actually in this field of uh, pruning quantization, knowledge distillation and such techniques also, uh, which try to optimize the models. Now, the question seems to be that uh, does it uh, is there a trade-off, first of all? Is there a trade-off in, uh, in uh, when, yeah. when you apply? And second uh, point seems to be that uh, are there techniques which can reduce the loss? I think that's the question. 
Yes, for sure. But but for example, when we talk, we talk. Answer one of the questions. I comment about uh, about uh, edging books, for example. It, it, when you use the when you use the the normal uh, TensorFlow uh, and um, uh, let's say workflow for for machine learning, it's it's common as you as you said as you said. We should, for example, I can create model uh, uh, training a, a big model. I usually what I do, including. I try to use architecture that was created to be very, very a lot of accuracy with a with a with a lower size, perfect. So after that, we use pruning. That was I let 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 turn off uh, neurons and and uh, synapses. Let's say that was not uh, enough. After that, I say, oh okay. When I train a model, what at the end of the day, what I'm talking, it's it's calculate all the. All the the the, the weight, you no? Know? Yes, the how the one neuron communicates with the other. Well, the, the the weight of that that connection. So usually we use uh, floating as a technical. We use floating floating point uh, data. So it's four bytes. I can use quantization reduced to one byte. Perfect. Oh, we reduce four to one. I do. I do. I do. I went to to a smaller thing. Of course. When you do that, if I'm talking about using float, this is more simple to see. If I float to 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 integer, I lose a little bit here. But what what's happened is nowadays we have techniques that we can, for for example, edge impulse develop things that they call ion that you can reduce half of the memory because at the end of the day, when I talk optimization, we are talking about a model that can be shrink. To be fitted in uh, 50 kilobytes, 100 kilobytes of memory. That, that's the situation. That's the that's the memory that I have inside those kind of say, of, of device. And the Edin Pusca, there is there is Eon is one of very interesting thing because with Eon, for example, they can reduce half. With zero was a technique that they used to reduce zero without without lose accuracy. So I said, okay, now I reduce. Now we can return back and say, okay, let, let's maybe change the quantization. I did a quantization all the time. I, I did a quantization with the input data, with the with the with, with the with the inside or with the with, with the, the weight in, in, in the layers with the end. Oh, now we can maybe be less aggressive and be a kind of a, of a, of trade. What I must tell you is that uh, a lot of examples that I'm I'm saw, saw nowadays, we can use all those techniques. And at the end, the accuracy we are losing, we are losing the trade-off is very, very small. And again, we must remember that TNML is a kind of uh, you know the first the first line. When you have a TNML model that are in the field and that they capture something or set alarm or do something, is the first thing. Is the oh, something is not is not is, is not doing well? So I can connect to a higher model, a more complex model that can continue doing the job. In this case, I I lose more power, etc. But uh, but uh, let's say I I, I save the, the 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 power for a long time. So in a very specific time, I send data for somewhere that I need to, including I can send data like using LoRa technology with a very small number of bytes, for example. Not need to to send data in a in a big big throughput. Let's say I. You know. Really interesting, really interesting. I think uh, this again points to uh, Marcelo's answer just now. Again, points to the importance of end-to-end -end system design. For, for me, that's what it points to. And it is a great challenge, interesting challenge. I think we should talk offline to, uh, uh, to offer a challenge problem statement next year. That is my conclusion out of this, uh, Marco and Marcelo. Thank you very much for uh, staying back. I think it Thank is you. 15 minutes. We are 15 minutes over. This is a record. You know, we, we have never done this before. Thank you for your patience and time. And most, I, I think most of the participants are still here. That shows the interest level. Uh, thank you again from our side. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you thank so you. much, Vishnu, uh, for moderating the Q&A. It's quite a uh, very interesting discussion, I think. Uh, so much interest in this field. We can see several applications. We see applications that are fancy and we can see applications that can help uh, people in different parts of the world. So it's quite interesting. And I would like to reiterate what Vishnu said that it would be nice to have this as problem statement in the next year. For more sessions, please uh, visit the AI for Good uh, website. You'll see more upcoming events. 
So from me and my colleagues at the ITU AI and Machine 5G Challenge, I would like to wish you a good day and bye-bye.